Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Yes, I'm meant to be on a holiday. Anyone that's been keeping an eye on my Twitter account will know. But Tottenham Hotspur, for some unknown reason, completely coincidence, but always stuff seems to happen when I take any time off. Um, I can guarantee it's nothing to do with anyone there thinking, hey, let's prank Alistair Gold and muck up his uh, time off. I think it's just purely... Um, Rubbish timing on my part, um, although it's half term, so it was time to be with the kids um, and the sunshine, as you can probably tell by my slightly pink face. Um, but yeah, let's cut to it. So, Antonio Conte, from what I understand, is close to being named the manager of Tottenham Hotspur, um, which is crazy in a good way and a fascinating way. Uh, I'm going to come to. I'm going to have a little chat about kind of all the different sides to it. Um, as a journalist, very excited about it because it's someone completely different. It's a very, he's a very um, charming yet volatile character. From I know people that have covered him in the past, both in England and Italy as well. Um, he's going to be absolutely fascinating, and I understand it is now. Barring a disaster, you know, which still can happen, but barring a disaster, it's just going to be a case of now finalising the little, little finer details, and um, and Antonio Conte will be named as the next Tottenham Hotspur manager. Which, bear in mind, it just shows in football how much can happen in like a week or so. Because, you know, he wasn't the first choice. You know, which is which is a funny how we've ended, how we've come here, and I think him leaving into Milan has suddenly opened a door, um, well, clearly a very attractive, I think I've said this before, attractive financially because suddenly a guy who would have had a huge buyout clause would suddenly was suddenly available for nothing. Um, he does come with financial stuff, though, which we will come to. Um, but so, I mean, let's, let's talk through exactly the process of what happened. So, Mauricio Pochettino was Tottenham's first choice. He was, that's what's been happening in the last, what, fortnight or so they have been desperately trying to prize Poch back away from PSG. Pochettino, they held talks with Pochettino. Pochettino wanted to come back. Understand apart from the element this is unfinished business he said he had before at Spurs. I think he hasn't really settled particularly in, in Paris. He's um his family life is slightly he's a very big family man is Poch. And right now, from what I understand, he's been living in a hotel in Paris with his coaching staff and his, his oldest son Sebastiano. Um, who is one of the, the uh, kind of sports science guys. He's come with him. He did the same role at Spurs. But back home, obviously, his younger son, Maurizio, who is um, a professional uh, winger for uh, Watford. I think he made his, yeah, I think he made his debut in a championship as well. So, you know, hopefully a burgeoning career for him. Um, and I think, from what I understand, Poch's wife, Karina, on the whole, has remained back in the UK as well. So, you know, we we all know what this is like, football or not, you know, splitting a family and being far away and obviously with the restrictions in kind of getting back and forth from, from France to England this year, it's it kind of been easy. Um, and yeah, so from what I understand, this is what I was told. Again, PSG are vehemently denying this as they would and probably should. I understand that uh, Poch said, you know, made PSG aware that he wanted to return to England. Um, but PSG, you know, they have the power. They it sounds like he man. They have the power to the financial might to quite frankly say if they want to keep a manager, they will keep that manager because it doesn't matter what someone offers. They can just say no, um, and that's what happens. I understand. You know, uh, digging around again today. Yes, I got in trouble with my time off as well for doing that, but. Um, the potch door is closed. It is, you know, anyone hoping maybe for a last, a last gasp turnaround. From what I'm told, it's closed now, and that just, you know, Spurs have to move on. Um, I'd imagine I wouldn't be shocked if Potch comes out now with something publicly, uh, saying, you know, committing his future to club or saying that I never wanted to go and and any of that. And I think for him that would be the intelligent thing to do because I certainly know. Some of the PSG fans are kind of wondering, like, well, why aren't you coming out and, and saying to us you want to stay or, or fighting off these rumours? Because, you know, PSG are briefing all the French journalists saying, look, he's not going anywhere. I don't know what this is all about, blah, blah, blah. Poch has been very quiet, other than one photo of him having some mate with his um, PSG top on. But 
that's not really sending a message, is it? It's, it's very, if it is, it's a very subtle one. So I think for Poch, the best thing for him now is to come out, say that, crack on. And, and I do think PSG with a proper Pochettino preseason will be a very different beast next season. I think I wouldn't be shocked if he absolutely sweeps to the league and title. So I think, you know, again, families are the most important thing and hopefully he gets that situation resolved. But yeah, for Spurs, that door closed. Um, I know they were also very interested in Eric Ten Hag. He was a kind of, they saw him as a, I suppose, like a, a version of Poch, uh, kind of a next generation, not next generation, because he's quite young Poch, but another version of Poch. Maybe not having the same charisma. Um, I've heard some people certainly that cover Dutch football say he hasn't really got that kind of, um, how do I put it? Yeah, the charisma is probably the best way. The charisma about him, but he's a very technically superb coach gets the best out of players and they kind of saw him as a future one then like I say Conte came on the market I think that changed a lot of thing uh, a lot of things so they went this ideal profile they had pretty much if they couldn't get Poch who was always the reference point for that profile if they couldn't get Poch oof, profile went out the window because and I understand it Antonio Conte is the Glamour appointment. He is the sexy Hollywood poster boy of winning titles, winning trophies and everything. He is. And you can understand completely if you've seen in the past, well, we know Daniel Levy went for Jose Mourinho. I can absolutely see him being that guy. <laughs> He's like that meme, isn't he? The, I can't remember what they call it, but the guy turning around on the pavement and seeing the woman walking by. That is so Daniel Levy. He is seeing Antonio Conte walking by out of the um, Inter Milan's, you know, camp and he has looked at him and just like, oh hello you know let, let's let's do this kind of thing but I must make it clear it was only once they absolutely knew the door was closed with Pochettino that they really pushed on with those talks I think the contact had been made with Conte and his representatives um, but they didn't really push it to advanced levels until they heard that bang this door's closed from PSG and Poch uh, for Poch so yeah so now Antonio Conte. Let's move on to this one. It's it's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating for me because I see a lot of the Mourinho appointment in it. I don't think he's... I wouldn't say similar to Mourinho. I don't think that. I don't think that at all. I see the appointment being similar in terms of he's a guy who... He, we'll come to it again, but history shows that he has required a lot of funding. He does not stay long at clubs. Uh, two years at every single club, barring Juventus, and also only two years with the Italian national team. I think Juventus, he was there for three. Um, he does not stick around. He is not a project man. He is not there for the long haul. Um, and, you know, I'll take some little bits later on. I'll tell you some little bits that kind of Italian journalists have said about him and stuff. Um, but that aside, he is a winner. He's an absolute winner. He has, you know, obviously he's won the Premier League with Chelsea. He has won Serie A just most recently with Inter Milan. Uh, he's won titles galore with Juventus. Um, and he did well with the Italian side as well. You know, that's... I certainly will be speaking about the financial support he needs, but I think the Italian job is probably a good example of where, coaching-wise, he got a lot of praise for just purely the coaching element. So that's important as well. But yeah, he's... It's so the opposite of what Tottenham are looking for. That's that's the thing that I find absolutely mad about it. Um, and I just want to read you, even as close as what we a fortnight ago, so final game of the season, this is what Daniel Levy wrote to the fans. Um, we are acutely aware of the need to uh, select someone for to be the next head coach, as he called it, whose values reflect those of our great club and a return to playing football with the style for which we are known, free-flowing, attacking and entertaining, while continuing to embrace our desire to see young players flourish from our academy alongside experienced talent. That's not Antonio Conte. That's not. That's, I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff about Conte is just as defensive as Mourinho, blah, 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 blah. He's not. He's not. You can't tar him with that brush. He doesn't, he plays a different brand of football. It's, Based on a more solid foundation, I'd say defensively, uh, than, you know, say Poch and stuff. Although, you know, we could always say Poch had the best or joint best Premier League defence for like two, three years running. 
But no, Conte wouldn't say like that. You know, I know, obviously, I know my colleagues that have covered Chelsea in the past. They, they, they can be quite direct. I wouldn't say they're, you know, probably playing sexy passing football you're going to maybe look for, but they do look to attack. Um, but they, as I say, built on a sound foundation. But yeah, certainly that Levy statement, it's not, Antonio Conte, it's not. It's it's not in keeping with, the, you know, all, all, all of the, the, the values, blah, 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 blah. We'll come to that in a minute exactly why. But you can't escape from the fact that he's a winner. He is a winner and he would win at all costs. Um, and he will very much be winning ahead of club, ahead of everything. And again, that's something we're going to touch on because there's, there's a lot more to talk about with Antonio Conte, a hell of a lot. Um, yeah, like I say, as a journalist, very excited because from what I'm told, dealing with him as a journalist is excellent. He can say anything. He's very honest. Uh, perhaps too honest. He's um, a great character. I mean, you see him on the touchline. He's an absolute madman by the looks of it, by the way he reacts. Um, and he will not take any rubbish. He won't. You know, he will very much, if people feel right now or had that Mourinho would shut people out and not let them back in his team, Conte will do exactly the same. If you displease him or he doesn't believe you should be part of his regulars you are done you know this is a guy who knows his own mind and he has like Mourinho the silverware to, to back it up um, but what I would say and this has to be a part of it of course he needs funding he does you know I've seen some very eloquently put uh, defenses of him not defenses but you know saying why he's great at this why he does that and why all this I've seen people saying oh he's taken you know, this team from here to here, and he has, and he has, he certainly, this is the thing I want to make key, uh, make clear, I definitely believe he can improve players, and that's a huge thing, he can improve players, but on the other side of the coin, he does need backing in the, in the transfer market, he does, and this for me is going to be the most fascinating part of it all, because a lot of what I've just said, it was very similar to Mourinho, and you know, you could argue Mourinho got a lot of players. Did he get the exact backing in the ways he wanted? Probably not. Um, did he get that, you know, experienced centre-back that he wanted? No. Um, so with Conte, you know, I've seen, like I say, people saying that he took blah, blah, Team X from seventh to title winners. He took another team from mid-table to what? But I looked kind of back and he didn't do that. You know, we're not talking about a guy who came in mid-season and dragged them up. He had a summer. Um, I want to get this right so I don't do him any disservice. So Juventus, first summer, brought in 12 players. Um, so yeah, of course, bang, they went on and, and became a much better team. Chelsea, in his first summer, spent £120 million on five big players, which included uh, Kante, uh, Luis, Alonso. So big players for that team. You remember that team? We should because they're the one that picked Tottenham for the title. Um and Inter Milan, again, took over a team that had been struggling, took them up. But in that first summer, 12 new players came in, including Romelu Lukaku, who was £74 million. Um, you know, so this isn't a guy that comes in and just says, lad, I'll take what you got and I will make it shine. It's not exactly what he does. He comes in and says, right, that'll do, that'll do, he'll do, he'll be brilliant, excellent, I can make him better, but I'm going to need this, this, this and this. And that's a very different thing when it comes to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, and that's what's going to be, I'm going to find uh, fascinating, probably more than anything about it. I think we said this with Mourinho. We said, how is he going to gel with Daniel Levy? That's going to be so key. And from everything you hear about Conte, those above him, he will eventually fall out with. And often within a year to 18 months, it doesn't take long. Uh, if he needs to feel that he's being financially backed, which for me kind of raises raises two questions, really. It's, um, oh, one other thing I just wanted to say, when I've mentioned this before on in articles or social media or whatever, people have come back and said, oh, yeah, but you look at the net spend. The net spend, at what he's done, it isn't as much. And, and that's absolutely right. But what I would say to that is, let's be, um, say, Inter Milan players or Juventus players or Chelsea players, you get a much higher fee for those players being sold on most of the time. They're quite often high-value players who will fetch a lot, and that's why it balances it out. Tottenham Hotspur, let's be honest, 
not the greatest at selling players, not good at selling them at the right time, not good at getting the good value for them. And especially if you look at the current squad, the players you'd probably look to move on, or Conte you think would look to move on, they're not going to be the high-value players. They're going to be players in the last 12 months of their contract and things like that. So it's all very well looking at net spend at places where I think, you know, I think I've worked it out. Chelsea over two years, he was only there for the two seasons. He spent circa £350 million. Others will say, yeah, but he brought in, or he the club brought in a certain amount, so net spend... If you were to spend three hundred fifty million at Spurs, you're gonna make about <laughs> you're gonna make a fraction of that back in sales. Did you see what I mean? It's a it's a very different beast, Tottenham Hotspur. And this, for me, I find in kind of this is a bit I really think I want to get to the bottom of is that if he is to sign, and as I've said, I believe it's close, he will have been given some kind of assurances. You know, people might say, yeah, yeah, but so was Mourinho. So what? But He's not going to sign on. A man who has just left Inter Milan, who are a club in absolute financial dire straits, and he wanted them to spend more this summer, not sell. Though he was told he had to get rid of £80 million worth or €80 million Euros worth of players, and he said, no, I'm not doing that. I want to bring in more. We need to strengthen. Um, so for me, a man that has just come from a club saying that, he's not going to walk into a Tottenham Hotspur and just say, yeah, yeah, no, I saw how pants you were last season, but yeah, I can do some good stuff with them players. That's not what he's like. He's a guy who wants to win and he wants to he doesn't want to have his reputation besmirched by a crap season at Tottenham Hotspur. He will not want it. So that's the bit I find fascinating, because where's that money coming from? As I've said a million times, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but <clears throat> pandemic wise is stuff Tottenham. A lot of money all of their assets really are in the stadium. Um uh, you know, property, things like that. So it's not like they have cash ready available. Uh, they bought, they raised um, 250 million recently from um, private payments. I think it's called, I can't remember the exact term. But essentially that's to go to pay back the Bank of England loan that kept them afloat uh, during the pandemic, which they had, uh, well, they predicted 200 million pound in revenue loss. So that's kind of filling that gap. So the money to spend on the squad has to come from one of two places for me. It has to mean either the name and rights deal is close, which I don't know it is. I haven't heard any indication it is. Um, but, you know, Todd Klein, uh, the new chief executive, uh, chief financial officer, has been brought in to do that, to sell that. And he has history of doing it. Or the other place the money comes from is selling Harry Kane. That, for me, I can't imagine, purely because what I've said before about the huge astronomical price, although I did wonder after that Champions League final whether... Man City might have thought, stuff this, we need to sign him. It doesn't matter now, you know, we can't muck around. Um, but the flip side to that is I feel, and everything we know about Conte, he adores Harry Kane. He sees him as the absolute pinnacle of being a striker. Um, and obviously he's only kind of got better since Conte said all of that. So I'd be stunned if Spurs now decided to sell Kane. So that's another revenue outlet cut off. I mean, obviously... And the other one is if there's suddenly big investment from outside into the club. We know Joe Lewis in 20 years hasn't put money really into the club. So it's unlikely to be him unless he's just, after 20 years, suddenly decided, yeah, why not? Which I can't see. Unless there's some investment coming in from elsewhere, someone buying in. But you'd think the time and the process that takes to do that would maybe you know require a bit more time and kind of we'd know that was coming as it were uh so yeah so i'm fine uh, financed i am fascinated to see where this money comes from um because otherwise i cannot see why conte would put his signature on that dotted line it doesn't really make much sense at all but um yeah what was the other thing i was going to say about money there was another one i don't know i don't know i mean I think I've probably covered it there, to be honest. Let's be honest. It's We know what Tottenham's financial situation is. And I think, for me, this is the big <sighs> key key question, really. Because on if he's backed, Antonio Conte is one of the best managers in the world. He wins trophies. He wins league titles. Uh, he wins, you know, domestic cups. But he needs to be backed and if you don't you get another kind of Mourinho situation of bringing in a glamour appointment 
that's caught your eye and you know the fans will probably, the bulk of them will be excited by. I think the players will be very excited by it. Um, but w- you're then becoming, I think the, the best phrase was when Mourinho was asked, are Spurs going to become the only club you've never won a trophy at? And he was like, well, no, I hope not. But they did. Um, and that's the thing for me. Is Tottenham Hotspur... Is it actually, in its current state, the perfect fit for the Mourinho's and Conte's of the world? My gut tells me no, but my hope is that there is some finance coming from somewhere that doesn't involve Kane, um, and that Spurs can suddenly leap up a whole new level and become a very different club. My gut tells me no. <laughs> like I say, my gut says I don't. This is like when people say, oh, yeah, but, you know, Conte will come in and he'll say this, I want that. And Daniel Levy will will go, oh my God, whatever you say, Antonio. It's not. If Jose Mourinho can't make that happen, neither can Antonio Conte. You know, we're, we're not talking about a guy in Daniel Levy who suddenly might, just wakes up one morning and thinks, I'm going to do everything really differently. Yeah, let's go wild, boys. Way. It's just That's not the way he is. Um, and nobody tells him what to do. It just They just don't. So... This kind of feeling that Conte will come in and, you know, let's not forget, Conte makes these demands of clubs. He's, he does it at every single club. And at every single club, he's left because of it. He hasn't actually really got his way. I mean, um, Juventus, there's a little quote he came out with. So he won the 2014 title, uh, Serie A title. And he was quoted as saying, literally in the, within the celebrations about next season and preparing... And he used the the sentence, well, you cannot go at, go out to eat at a 100 euro restaurant with 10 euros in your pocket, as if to say, we need to push on next season, we need to spend more, we need to, you know, rival everyone that's going to look to to kind of catch up with us. Conte resigned in the second uh, day of pre-season after that, apparently. Um, so that didn't work. Chelsea, we know it all went a bit pear-shaped and... I think it ended up being, wasn't there a legal battle over unpaid salary? It was all very, very messy as he went out the door. And into Milan, you know, we, we, we know what happened there because, like I just said, the club's in kind of real financial dire straits and he still wanted more money. And he said, essentially, if you're not backing me, let me go. Um, so he is a man who will, yes, lay down what he wants. But if he doesn't get what he wants, he will pack up his bags and go. Um, which is all part of this big old thing of whoa, it's like the appointment is mad. It's it's exciting and mad and doesn't really it makes sense in a glamour world. It makes sense in a we want those trophies he does he gets mode uh, world. But on the flip side is if you don't provide him with the variables and conditions that environment that he requires to do that. He's going to also, like Mourinho did, find it impossible to transfer what he did elsewhere to Tottenham. There is so much pressure on Daniel Levy on this. This, for me, Mourinho was a a huge appointment that everything was down to Levy's choice. If Conte fails, I I think... I think... (sighs) I don't know how to put it. It's difficult because I don't want to say Levy has to fall on his sword, Levy has to go, any of this, because essentially he's a part owner and he's probably more powerful than just a normal chairman. Um, but, my God, it becomes very difficult to kind of continue down the the path he's on if Conte fails as well, because it would be two ridiculously high-profile, expensive appointments, but bringing them into a club that can't handle expensive high profile appointments and you know it may work it may be absolutely fantastic Conte may get to be the brilliant manager he has been elsewhere with the financial backing there's some little you know people are saying that perhaps you know people are kind of suggesting there is finance coming in again I don't know where it's from unless it's from one of those avenues I spoke of before um but yeah we'll see it's it's just it's just mad I mean we talk about kind of the formation we know his favorite formation is a three five two which is going to be very different for Tottenham. Uh, they're going to need change. It's Again, the formation itself dictates new signings because, let's be honest, Spurs couldn't string together two decent centre-backs together last season, let alone three. 
I think it will help players like Joe Roden. I think Joe Roden in a back three has looked at his best. Um, and I think, you know, whoever comes in, whatever they start out as, Levy's brief to them always is they have to develop young players and include them in what they do and bring them on. And I do feel, you know, Joe Roden will be one of those. Um, there's a lot of talk that Ondembele, Tongi Ondembele will flourish under him. He'll have to work bloody hard. He won't be able to, if he thought he was going to get another manager that would let him muck about and not be absolutely at his fittest, that's not going to be the case. He's going to have that with Conte as well. But I think he could shine in the Conte system. Um, what it does also do is it puts highlights the wing backs um, with Spurs. I think Sergio Regulon, for all the flack he got towards the end of the season, I think as a wing back could actually be incredible. It could really, really be good. And also a much maligned man in Matt Doherty would be going back to the favoured position where he did so well at Wolves. Um, they may well look to bring in a specialised, you know, another right wing back or a left wing back or whatever. Because, um, you know, you may look at that and say, you know, I've always said that Ben Davies is so versatile and he's such a strong, um, you know, uh, person in the squad. He may look at that and say, well, Ben Davies in that system maybe is better as a left-sided centre-back and actually... Ryan Sessegnon could come back and be that wing back as well and, and battle with Regulon. But then obviously you probably need another right wing back because Jafet Tanganga is not going to be great for that, but he could be very good as the right sided centre back. So I've <laughs> actually, having said that they need all these centre backs, but actually some of the existing people that have been used out wide could kind of be converted into um, centre backs, but I still think they'll go for new centre backs. Uh, yeah, Joe Jim Anderson has. At Leon, obviously at Fulham last season, has, has been a um, someone at the club have been looking at for a long time. Um, back when he was at St. Dory as well, so he could be one that very much is suggested to Conte, and they may push forward. We'll see how that works. But yeah, the system's going to be really interesting. He's a big fan, like I said, of Kane, but he's also has said a lot of big stuff about um, Deli Ali before. So I wouldn't be shocked to see him kind of try to figure out and get the best out of Deli Ali as well. How that works in the three five two, we'll see. I mean, it may be, uh, you know, it may be sitting just behind the two strikers. I mean, does the two strikers is that striker going to be? You'd imagine in that formation, it has to be Son, Son and Kane up front together as a duo. You'd still need to sign another striker if Vinicius is not coming back, which I'd imagine, I'd imagine he won't. Um, but yeah, there's a. It's going to be for me again as a journalist. That was the thing. I, people kind of always said, oh, you only wanted Poch to come back. Do you know what? I'd say out of the three, the three kind of main candidates towards the end, which were Poch, Ten Hag and Conte, for me, on in terms of the football and in terms of the fit, I actually probably would have gone for Ten Hag. And that's, you know, that's not to say that the other two aren't brilliant. But I just, if I'm looking at the finance side, which I, you know, my gut tells me Conte won't get quite as much as he thinks he's going to get. And as I said before with Poch, as much as I'd love to see him come back and finish his business, um, that sounded weird, but coming back and doing that, I still think it's probably just too early. I kind of have always said that. I just feel I'd, I'd like to see him win uh, the title in France as well, get that under his belt and yeah, who knows? If Conte does blow up after 18 months, two years, and does what his entire career suggests he will do, maybe that'll be the time for Poch to come in. But for me, I kind of felt in terms of the actual moment, probably Ten Hag was the better fit in terms of uh, you know a guy that could really just work and improve players but wouldn't require big changes. Because I think Poch would have required assurances of change as well. You know, I think he would have, because otherwise he's just walking back into the same job he... he uh, Parted company with, you know, back in 2019. So, yeah, so no, people that suggest, oh, you know, he's a Poch fanboy, he only wants him. Um, no, no, to be honest. I, I did think Ten Hag was probably the better fit. Um, but I do, uh, like I said, I need to report on what I saw. It was that was that, and what I knew was that Spurs desperately wanted Poch back. He was the top choice. Uh, it didn't happen, and then they've turned, rather than to Ten Hag, they've turned to um, Conte because, well, you know why. Glamour, silverware, bang, all of that. But as a fit, we're going to find out very quickly whether uh, you're jamming the wrong jigsaw pieces into the wrong puzzle. We'll see. But uh, no, as a journalist, I'm going to be fascinated to see on the, on the pitch how it works. 
off the pitch, how it works. Um, and there's a little bit more to it as well, obviously, in that there's there's a lot of kind of, um, well, I've heard there is as well. So it's not like it's just buzz out there. It's something that I've been told as well, that if Conte comes in, which, as I said, looks like it's going to happen now, uh, Fabio Paratici, uh, I may have absolutely murdered the pronunciation of that, his former Juventus director of football will likely join him. Um, which, he's an interesting one. He's a very interesting one. I've heard very good things about him. I've um, heard that he's a very astute guy, very clever guy. I have also heard, because as, as I always say, this is the thing, I think people think that I go one way or the other. I try not to. I try to kind of balance stuff up. So like I say, I've heard really good stuff about him, that he's a very intelligent guy, very, very good at his job. But also from people that I know who cover him in Italy have also said he was very, very good at Juventus when he was working, I want to get the name right, at Juve under the CEO Beppe Morata. Marotta? I think it's Marotta. Um, but when Marotta left and... Um, Paratici was left in sole charge of transfers, things became a little bit more mixed. Um, the, what's levelled against him by those in Italy, they say that he's a fantastic talent spotter. That is, he is supreme at that. He will kind of pluck these uh, kind of young talents and, and these very talented players and he will bring those. He'll often do a lot of free transfer work. He will do some very expensive signings, but he'll also do some free transfer work. Um, but what they also say and this is a key one for Tottenham, is that apparently he struggles, he kind of has a bit of a track record of struggling to sell players. And my goodness, at Tottenham, that, that could be a real thing. When you look at some of the players that they want to move on, I probably would say they're, they're more difficult to sell for the value they want for them. So there's that side to it. Um, and also another accusation levelled at him was that he doesn't, he, he maybe isn't as good as building a balanced squad as you need. Um, again, if he does come in, um, it will be my first experience of him. And, and this is what I've done with everyone as well. It's the same with Poch when he first came in, same with Mourinho, and it'll be the same with Conte, and it'll be the same with the new director of football. I, I just always, whatever you thought before, you've always got to view him with fresh eyes and see how it works. I was exactly that way with Mourinho. I said what I thought, exactly kind of very similar to Conte, in that I felt that if he wasn't the right fit, we'd know quite quickly. Uh, but I was very excited to see what he could do. And that's exactly the same with Conte. And that will be the same with Paratici as well, in terms of, yes, there's these good stuff about him that I've heard and there's bad stuff about him, but ultimately you can only judge yourself, can't you, when they're actually in the role. So that would be fascinating to see. And uh, yes, I'm aware I've used the word fascinating far too many times. Um, what that does leave um, is the question of what happens to Steve Hitchin. Um, Steve Hitchin is the technical performance director, but... Technically, he is also, you know, he is his role also encompasses really being the director of football. Um, his record's been, I'd say, you know, we're saying about Paratici being mixed. I'd say it's probably the same. I think there's been some very good transfers come in. He hasn't really been a director of football very long. You know, you're looking at kind of unofficially, really. I think we're looking at from Poch's last summer. Um, so yeah, you could argue that some of those haven't worked. Some of them are very talented players that maybe the players themselves need to give a bit more. Obviously, last summer, I you know I know a lot of people have kind of revised the history on that. But let's be honest, when that window closed, other than maybe having a top top centre back, I think we all looked back on that window and thought, bloody hell, that's a good window. Um, but what I always think absolutely stuffed Steve Hitchin was that um, the Amazon documentary clip, which has been misquoted, taken out of context. And, you know, anyone that watched that knows exactly what he said. He said the January transfer window is just a mess of a window. It's very difficult to do anything properly in. And I hate it. That's what he said. And that is true. Whatever you want to say about it, whatever you want to use to clobber anyone with it, that actually is a true statement. Very few clubs do anything in a January window. I think he said it's the window of panic and desperation, something like that. And it is. But obviously what happened to the bloke was that, you know, people just took out, I hate it. I think it was the subtitles at the bottom of the screen. And that was applied to our director of football hates transfer windows. What, what, what chance have we got if our director of football hates transfer windows? I don't know why I'm doing that accent. I don't know what they sounded like. Um, 
But yeah, so from that moment on, he kind of has become a bit of a social media figure of... There's a bit of hate. I think he gets lumped in with Levy sometimes, a uh, figure of fun and all this sort of stuff. Whereas, I don't know, I just look at what Hitchin's done and I kind of... I think it's... I think it's been a mixed bag. There's some players I absolutely love that he's brought in. On the Belen Celso, people will have their qualms about them, their injuries and all that. But I do think they could be two incredible Premier League players if they can, you know, absolutely hit their, their top kind of mark. I think Gareth Bale could have been more, but he wasn't, I suppose, allowed to be, I guess. I think Sergio Regulon will be a fantastic uh, left back. And I think, like I say, in Conte's system, I think it'll be incredible. Uh, I think Hoybier was a big hit. Um, I think Hart has kind of done the job called upon, really, asked of him. Doherty has had a mare, but then I think that's probably mostly because... Oh, I'm going to it again, but, you know, very quickly, Regulon coming in, changed his role, made him more of an orthodox right-back rather than a bombing-on right-back, and I just don't think he adapted very well. But he may, again, in the Conte system work. Um, and then looking back to the previous one, Ryan Session, oh, like, honestly... Ryan Session has been one I will always pick up because I think he's going to be a star. I think he just needs time. And he's bulked up a bit in Germany as well, which I think will do him wonders. He had a very good very good loan spell with Hoffenheim as well. So I do wonder whether we'll look back on Hitchens here a little bit differently in the future. If he is, if Paratici does come in and he's replaced, I do wonder whether that will be slightly looked back on. I think he gets... It's weirdly lumped in with some of like the previous like Paul Mitchell's ones, like people like Nkudu and stuff like that get chucked into his. Um, so yeah, so uh, and what I always say, what I always say, and I've said this about every director of football whenever I've spoken about them, director of football job at Spurs is a tough gig. Don't let anyone tell you it isn't. You know it is. You know you look at who's been there before. You've had, uh, and this is in the Enoch era under Daniel Levy. You've had. Frank Arneson, Damien Connolly, you've had Franco Baldini, you've had, like I say, Paul Mitchell, you've had Steve Hitchin now, and then potentially, once Conte puts pen to paper, you could also have Fabio Paratici. And Arneson aside, who went off to Chelsea, you could probably look at it all and say they all left pretty frustrated. Um, because this is the other thing, I said this earlier, you know, People who are saying Conte or Mourinho, oh, they'll make Levy change his ways. They'll tell him what to do. The same's always said about this director of football thing. Like I've seen people saying this about Paratici already. Oh, Levy will relinquish control and, yeah, this guy will run it. He'll absolutely smash it. That would have been said about all of the other people before him. You know, they've, there has been a director of football type, whether it was in a different title, for much of Daniel Levy's era doesn't change anything if you haven't got the you know if you've got I don't want to be too dramatic but if you've got one hand tied behind your back are you going to be able to do the job you've done at other clubs no and this could be the case for Artesi it's a tough gig he's you know I think what we're just going to have to hope if he does come in that ultimately he can look to bring those cheaper deals he would maybe have the contacts and stuff and and, and look to to kind of uh maybe use some of his contacts to to rustle up better deals better players and there's a part of me that wonders will i don't know how it works in terms of legally and whether contracts were drawn up when he left or whether spurs can go to inter milan and, and you know i know it's very much like a vulture picking on a carcass but if inter are financially stuffed then tottenham can maybe go in and you can look at a, like a, a scrinier and say look you know, you wanted forty-three million before, and we were only going to offer about thirty-two million before. No, it was forty-five, and we were only going to offer thirty-two. You need the money, lads. We've—I don't know—we've just sold Eric Dyer, Davinson Sanchez, whatever. His his a much lower fee. Um, that may be what they look to do. You know, maybe uses to lose uses Italian contacts more than anything. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see. It's going to be. Uh, you know, a very, very different one. I mean, I was going to say that as well, yeah. Even my little note that I'd scribbled down there reminded me it's that this is the key thing for me that's going to be fascinating to see, is that Conte's critics say, and I've seen Italian journalists say this, and I've seen other people involved in other clubs say this as well, that he only cares about, not himself, but he cares about that gleaming bit of silverware. That is it. He does not care how he gets there. 
He doesn't care how what happens within the club. He doesn't care what happens with the players. He doesn't care what happens with the fans. Ultimately, eyes on the prize. That, I think, leaves chaos in his wake when he leaves. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what Tottenham Hotspur, that we know it, is like in, let's say, two years' time. I think we'd hope that if it is going to be left in disarray, it'll have been left in disarray with silverware. Um, but I just wonder, the Lillian Conte mix for me. I mean, Paratici may well be coming in as the buffer. That may be what that's about. Uh, you know, like I say, Juventus was the club that he spent a bit longer at. He was there for three years rather than two um, before ultimately going. So maybe that guy, you know, maybe comes in as a bit of a buffer and helps that. But still, where's the money coming from? That's my major thing on that. Um, and I'll be intrigued to see kind of how he uses the young players as well. He's a very unpredictable guy. Um, you know, he doesn't bend for his superiors whatsoever from everything people tell me. Um yeah, it's going to be fascinating. And, you know, I'd love to see what happens with Oliver Skip. You know, Oliver Skip uh, just been voted in the PFA Team of the Season for Championship. Um, incredible talent for Tottenham. He was kind of set to come back and really play a part. Much now depends on what Conte feels about Harry Winks. And, you know, Harry Winks may be someone that they think they can get some money for, or Conte may think he's a guy that I can really work with. Um but what does that mean for Skip? Or maybe Spurs will say to him, look, <laughs> yeah, you want these demands. Well, we also have some demands. And one of those is that we want you to use these young players like Rode and Skip, Sessegnon, and bring them on. Because I think Skip could be a big Premier League player next season, whether it be on loan at, back at Norwich or whether it is at Tottenham. I think he will only continue to push on. And you even look at someone like Troy Parrott, who... Just literally before I started filming this, um, I bagged a couple of goals. His first goals for Ireland as well, which will be huge for him. Yes, it was Andorra. Yes, it was. The first goals, I only seen the first goal. It was a very good header. Um, but yeah, players like that, you know, some people tell me that he, Conte, has developed young players. Some others tell me, no, he will look towards the more experienced ones first before the young players. So he's just this incredible melting pot that have been very different personalities thrown together it all very much sounds like Mourinho in this respect and we'll just be intrigued to see I will what comes of it what comes next and what happens so apologies I have waffled on but hopefully we've covered both sides and I'm not going to come out of this with people saying oh he hates Conte or he loves Conte or, or whatever um I'd say I have no set opinion on him yet, um, which is probably the best way to be. I'm excited about seeing what he can do, but also a little bit, um, not concerned, but a little bit intrigued to see whether the past baggage is brought to Tottenham and how Tottenham deal with that. It's going to be fascinating to see. Oh, he's fascinated again. Sorry. Right, I'm going to head off now. I have to go back to my time off. Um, I'm not technically meant to be back till Sunday. Um, obviously, if something major breaks in the next couple of days, I'll jump on and probably do a video, write some stories as well. Like I say, I believe it's quite close on Conte. So it'd be intriguing to say, I think, and this is so stalkery, but judging by his Instagram, he looks like he's somewhere in Italy. You'd imagine that there's got to be a quarantine involved for him. I, I presume, I think someone mentioned to me five days. Um, I'm not entirely sure that. Maybe five days if you then have a negative test. So whether Spurs announce him by flying out some kind of shirt or someone buys a shirt and it's courier driven to him and he just holds it up or whether they want to wait until he's over here five days next week he's officially presented, I don't know. Whether we'll have a press conference, I don't know. That'd be great if they could. It'd be lovely to have a press conference. Um, but what, either way, let's get it done. Let's, let's get uh, get everything set before the Euros and it'll be fun, you know. As fans and as me as a journalist, we can kind of sit down and watch the Euros, kind of getting quite excited, I think, about what the new season will look like. Um, that was all we wanted. It's just the whole stagnating impasse that Spurs were stuck in was just so... I could see fans getting frustrated, and for me, I won't lie. You know, my job and how many articles I have to write a day, I was just... Whoa. Other than the manager search, which was interesting, but obviously slow-moving, I felt I was kind of... You write about stuff without knowing what it is. It's, you can't write about transfer targets. You can't write about players that fit, who will play where, if you don't know who the manager's going to be. And now it looks like we're going to have a bit of clarity on that. Um, and yeah, let's see where it takes us. Hopefully, 
Tottenham Hotspur have been a real malaise, haven't they, for the past two years or so. Let's get them back somewhere. Um, where that's going to be, we'll find out. It'll be very interesting. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to get back to the sunshine, making my shirt self go all sweaty and pink as I am right now. Um, and as always, you guys, look after, yourself, look after yourself, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and I shall catch you very soon. Bye.